It's ready. Alright, good. Let's do this again. You didn't just hear that. Hi. Hi. So, I I'd like you all to think back to high school, and I apologize if that was uncomfortable for anyone. Remember the weird kid? You know, zero social skills, gets caught one day in an empty classroom, kissing their hand? That was me. For as long as I can remember, I've created a connection with others, but I was a high school dork. This is me at 15, with my dad, you can see where I got my fashion sense. Yeah. <laughs> and that was my strong suit. Never had a date. Never went to my prom. I hated being lonely. I fantasized about having a girlfriend and being in love. But I was too terrified to talk to a girl. And when you're the weird kid, risk aversion is like 80% of high school. College was a different story. In college, I reinvented myself. I shed that awkward self-image, and I really learned to connect with myself and others. In other words, I was right on target to be giving a really cliché TED talk. Believe in yourselves, ugly ducklings. Luckily, my story turned out different. Dating for the first time as a young adult, I remember there was so much that just didn't make sense. Like, why are we taught to play mind games to attract <coughs> partners rather than just being ourselves? Why is friendship supposed to be affectionate, but asexual? If I have feelings for someone, why am I not supposed to have feelings for someone else? And of course, how do I know if I'm in love with the right person? Most of my questions revolved around monogamy. You find one partner you like, and you stay together until either you break up and start all over with someone else, or enough time goes by and you take the next step up the relationship ladder. The progression goes, Dating, dating exclusively, engagement, marriage, kids, 50th anniversary, and die mad. If you've done all that, congratulations, you win relationships. Any deviation, however, and your relationship is considered a failure. Of course, by that measure, nearly all relationships, no matter how enjoyable or educational, are failures. But that's the standard under which we're all raised, and by which we're all judged. Since my oh-so-awkward state, I've been very lucky, and I've dated some amazing people. But none were a perfect match. I realized we each need to give up some of our needs or wants in order to fit the other's idea. Now, some might say giving up some of your desires in order to make a relationship work is normal. But whether you consider compromise a necessary part of growing up or settling, it still means one or both of you aren't really being true to yourselves. Because no matter how compatible you are, the likelihood of any two people exactly matching all the other's wants and needs is minuscule. And then there are the wants and needs we don't know we want and need until our relationships teach us. For example, a possessive partner might show you the value of the time you spend with friends. A party animal might teach you that you really do prefer Saturday night's home on the sofa. The more we date, the more we learn. And even if we somehow find a match, people change. That's part of life. What I want now is not what I wanted five years ago or 10 years ago. I imagine it's the same for most of you. What we want in five or 10 years will be different too. It would be great if people in all relationships grew at the same rate and in the same direction, but that's not realistic. Most of us know people in unhappy relationships which have grown apart, but stay together, sacrificing their happiness for appearances, or the sake of the kids, or the fear of starting over at the bottom of the ladder. The worst part is, even though they know or suspect they're incompatible, they keep climbing. Finally, the one thing your perfect match can't be is someone else. Sure, you can role play or vary your routine, but the human brain craves variety and stimulation and occasionally bats with surprise. I should stop doing that. The human brain craves variety and stimulation. And in monogamy, the only way to experience someone new is to break up or cheat. And breaking up and cheating is what we do. Half of all marriages end in divorce. Three out of every four people will experience some form of relationship infidelity. And we all know people in 
successful relationships, which may never break up, but are far from successful. Being a romantic, I never wanted to commit to someone only to become a statistic or miserable because we weren't perfect match. But being logical, I knew there was no such thing as a perfect match. I still wanted my fairy tale romance, and I dated more and more, but I never found it. This being New York City, I did the reasonable thing and started seeing a therapist to find out why. <laughs> Had I just not met the one? It certainly wasn't for lack of looking. What was wrong with me that I couldn't have what everyone else seemed to have? And then I went on a date with Beth. According to her OkCupid profile, Beth was smart, creative, and polyamorous. And over dinner, learning about polyamory changed my life. Audience participation time. Show of hands. Clean your hands up. Ready? How many people here love their families? Okay. How many love their friends? So. <laughs> How many love their romantic partners? How many might still love their exes? Don't raise your hand if this will get you in trouble. <laughs> Well, hopefully we can all honestly say we love many people in our lives, which is phenomenal. Love, all love, is meaningful, and it gives our lives meaning. It deepens connections. It feels great to share. It's free. It doesn't even have calories. <laughs> so why should we limit it? Are we only able to love one person at a time? No, not at all. We just covered that. Besides, love is not a zero-sum game. This should probably go away. Love is not a zero-sum game. Imagine having a child whom you love wholeheartedly. When you have a second child, you don't cut that love in half and give half to each, or tell the second child, I'm sorry, but there's just no love left for you. <laughs> you give them both all your love. Resources are limited. Time, money, energy, all are limited. But the love we have to share is only as limited as we limit it. You might say, okay, well, I can feel love for many people, but I can only be in love romantically with one person. And I say, being in love is simply the expectation that someone we love loves us back the same way. Think about it. The truth is, the idea that romantic love must be exclusive is a social construct. We can, and often do, feel romantic love for more than one person at the same time. We're just not supposed to. Monogamy works amazingly well for some people, which I find inspiring and beautiful. But for people like me who feel something crucial missing in monogamy, learning about responsible non-monogamy can be transformative. From the Greek and Roman roots for many loves, polyamory encourages, polyamory encourages simultaneous loving relationships of any sort, physical, emotional, romantic, as long as everyone involved knows and consents. It's not polygamy, which is many spouses. What we think of as monogamy in dating is really monoamory, where the goal is to find and bond exclusively with the one person we love. Polyamorous or poly relationships are completely customizable by what we call negotiated agreements, which are decided by the people involved. This could look like primary partners with occasional secondaries, or multiple primaries, or a couple, any shape at all, really a couple, a V, a triad, a quad, or this. We call this polycule. Everyone should be communicating with their partners regarding their expectations, desires, and concerns. This doesn't mean that A necessarily has any direct interaction with G, but they should all be on the same page. Now, this concept works remarkably well for casual dating. It also works remarkably well for long-term relationships, raising families, and basically anyone living normal, well-adjusted lives. Any of these shapes could change or last for life.
So at this point, I'm guessing half of you are thinking, well, that seems pretty good, uh, at least in theory. Maybe it even sounds obvious. The other half are thinking, well, that can't possibly work. But it does. The keys are four C's, like the breadcrumbs. Compersion, communication, community, and compatibility. Oh, oh shit. I'm missing a... Oh, that's right. I, I, missed this, I missed this slide. Compersion, my favorite word. It means happiness and the happiness of others. If you've never heard of compersion, it's because we in the poly community made it up about 40 years ago. And we don't have a PR department. But you probably felt it. Have you ever run into one of your part, one of your friends right after they've gotten engaged? They're so excited. All they could talk about is the ring and the romance and the proposal and the surprise and the, their plans and the dates and, the, and they get this big goopy smile on their face. And you can't help but get excited for them. And then they see you getting excited for them, so then they get excited. And then you get more excited because they're getting excited because you've got... That's conversion. Conversion works in a relationship context by mentally shifting competition into cooperation. One of my best friends is this guy, Sam. A year ago, my girlfriend and I went to a party where we met Sam. started dating Sam. Now, we made up a word for that as well. A metamorph, your partner's partner, your traditional competition. Now, I could have pretended I wasn't jealous or tried to ignore it. Instead, I invited Sam out to lunch. Turns out we had a lot more in common than just our girlfriend. He's a hell of a guy, and we totally hit it off. To this day, Sam and I still meet for lunch every month. I've learned that your partner's partner aren't your enemy. You can be teammates working together, strengthening existing relationships while exploring new ones. It's like game theory nirvana. Everyone wins. And when this clicked for me, when I got this, my jealousy just disappeared. And when I got this, when this, when this clicked for me, when I got this, my jealousy just disappeared. But that doesn't happen unless you're all on the same page. And that doesn't happen without communication. Effective communication means sharing openly and honestly and without shame. It helps our partners understand where we are and what we want out of a relationship. And most people suck at it. But it's probably not your fault. We're not raised to actually risk sharing what's on our mind. I mean, could you imagine what first dates would sound like? <laughs> Even people who've been together for years still censor their <coughs> thoughts. I mean, when's the last time you heard anyone actually say something like, I don't know, I think your boss is dreamy, or I can't stand your mother, or yeah, those genes do make you look fat. <laughs> On the other hand, poly people tend to be pretty good at communication, mostly because we have to. We're balancing so many different people's priorities. It's the only way to make sure everyone's needs get met. I co-author an advice column called Polly Wanna Answer? <laughs> and most of our problems that we get revolve around poor communication. So I've got four steps which should probably help each of you, regardless of whether or not you're poly, improve your own communication. The first step is always identify what is it you really want and need, which is harder than it sounds? Step two, share your wants and needs with others in ways they understand. Three, listen open-mindedly to others' wants and needs. And four,
clarify agreements and boundaries. Basically, the overlaps get you both what you need, you can see which of your needs aren't being met, and you have a partner willing to help you expand your comfort zones. If you partner with more people, you can get more of your needs met while safely exploring more boundaries and understanding that this can be both healthy and fulfilling is the key to polyamory. Besides, I really like Venn diagram. When you combine compersion with communication, you build community. In the poly community, we actually talk about things like sex and emotions and fears. It's scary to be vulnerable, especially when we're so socialized against it. <coughs> it's scary to be vulnerable, especially when we're so socialized against it. But with the support of community and safe space, problems don't have to be secrets. Since discovering the polyamorous community, I've met literally thousands of poly people, of every race, color, religion, gender, orientation, sexual identity, and tax bracket, including many I'd known all along but had no idea they were poly. I wish they would have worn signs or something. It would have been so much easier. But for the first time, I didn't feel like a freak for wanting love but not feeling fulfilled by monogamy. Polyamory community helped me realize that I was always polyamorous, I just never had a word for it. And being part of the community now has allowed me to mentor others while continuing to learn myself. Last year, the very first publicly polyamorous house in New York City was created right here in Bushwick, and I was one of the community members that helped create it. Finally, understanding and accepting that one partner doesn't need to meet all our needs means the people in our lives can fit more naturally and organically without being pressured or forced into labels that aren't needed. And if something, if something doesn't work, we don't need to disconnect over it. Rather, we can connect over the things that do work. People also confuse love and sex all the time. It's axiomatic. We assume one implies the other. But while it's true that, let, while it's true that sex can make love stronger, and love can make sex better, they can also be independent. And assuming otherwise, like most assumptions, causes problems. But what's less well understood is this. People also confuse love with compatibility. Compatible partners are those who we match when we're each being the truest versions of ourselves and who share our goals for the future. Incompatible people fall in love all the time. If we as a society persist in the romantic but false assumption that love conquers all and we just need to try harder, we're only going to wind up with more of these statistics. And you know what these numbers tell me? That an incredible number of people are unhappy with their relationships. This doesn't mean they don't love their partners. It means they're not getting what they want or need. Self-denial might make you a better monk, but outside the monastery, it's a pretty horrible way to live. Knowing what I know now, I couldn't do it. My solution? Love. Wildly and with <laughs> reckless abandon. Don't treat love like a prize with one winner. Love the people in your life. Be open to loving the people you meet in whatever ways make sense to you. You won't run out. And saying, I love you, and meaning it, is one of the greatest pleasures. And if you want life partners, choose compatible ones who want the same life you do. I volunteer here in New York with a group called Open Love. And at our monthly discussion groups, I heard a great analogy. We're all sailing our individual boats down the river of time. Some sail closer to shore, some adventure further out. When we meet a life partner, we lash our boats together for stability and spend the rest of our journey together. But the best life partners are those who travel with you because they want to, not because they're tied to you. What I'd like to leave you with is this. Oh, I missed that. 
polyamory versus monogamy, there's no competition. I mean, it's obvious to me the best relationship structure is the one that works for you. My thing is not your thing, but your thing is okay. It doesn't matter what your thing is, but it is your responsibility to choose it. So, what is it that you really want and need? Good luck. Thank <laughs> you.